Welcome to Alienating the Audience. If you've ever been late to work because you got distracted reading Wikipedia articles about Firefly, tried to salvage a relationship through a tortured Star Trek analogy, or ended a relationship because of a fight you got into over Star Wars, welcome home. I'm Andrew Heaton, the thinking man's nerd. And today, we're going to give you some major fodder for future Star Wars-related arguments. Jonathan Last is going to join me in defense of the Galactic Empire. And if that sounds crazy to you, I promise, you're going to hear some really fascinating analogies involving Kaiser Wilhelm, ISIS, and a host of space fascists. Plus, we get into Machiavelli, Leo Strauss, and the Tarkin Doctrine. It's a very solid hour of Star Wars ethics and intergalactic space political theory. And afterwards, Nick Spurduti joins me to talk about our recent trip to Kashyyyk, the Wookiee homeworld. My guest today is Mr. Jonathan Last from The Bulwark, and he is a Galactic Empire apologist. You're an Imperial apologist, aren't you? I am. I was about to say, I know you have been for a while, but I, I, I didn't know if perhaps some of the new films had altered your perspective or anything like that. You know, if anything, they've only only hardened it, right. uh, I would say. But, I mean, one of the things that I made in my, my original case for the Empire, as I said, was the, the Rebellion seems to have no sense of what comes next. Right. The idea is, well, we got to get rid of this empire. Uh, and if you just sort of take what the evidence is on the ground in the films, then what comes after the empire would necessarily be much worse. And so the new films, the trilogy we're in the middle of right now, has actually shown that that is true. The First Order is objectively much, much worse than the Empire. The First Order is terrible. <laughs> okay. All right. And so the it's kind of the ISIS filling in the vacuum of Saddam. Very that kind much of thing. so. Right. Very much so. Or or the, you know, the barbarians filling in the vacuum of the Roman Empire or something like that. Uh, so I I actually think that. Uh, the more we've seen of Star Wars, the more vindicated I feel in my view that the Emperor was, while not perfect, on the balance better than the Rebellion. But there's there's a subset of people that like, – it's interesting. There's like a clique of uh, uh, DC journalists that, that are Imperial apologists and they'll kind of sprout every time that the film comes out. I first read your article in Defense of Empire – uh, I, which I think came out now 10, 15 years ago. It's been yeah. a while because it, it came out, I think, at the uh, right when episode three came out. Attack of the Clones, I think. Right. Uh, and it like and I but I only read it maybe three years ago. And it was akin to taking a drug trip because it was so different than the worldview that I was used to where very clearly the the Jedi are a force for good. The the Republic is the the stately old thing that we're trying to resurrect. And the Empire is an evil Dictator, fascist, uh, you know, uh, you know, uh, sort of zombie Ju Julius Caesar type uh, thing, or, or Dark Lord Julius Caesar type thing. So, walk me through the logic. If if we're if we're in the Star Wars universe here, and I'm I'm part of the rebellion. Um, let, let's let's say we're in the older Star Wars universe. We're we're in like a not not the current um, current track, but. Like episode four. Episode four, exactly. We're episode four. Uh, I'm I'm on uh, episode five. I'm on Hoth, and I'm 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 hanging out with the uh, the guy that played Cliff Clavin, um, and uh, <laughs> who's in it, by the way. Yes, uh, he's got a cameo in there. He is. Uh, and uh, but but I'm hanging out with him. If if we met at a bar and I was like I'm fighting the Empire, I'm all I'm all chips in. Uh, sell me. Why why should I be rooting for the Empire over the Righteous Rebellion? So when you look at what the Empire is doing. And one of the keys to understanding the Empire is what Vader says to Luke in Bespin uh, in, in Empire Strikes Back, Episode 5. He says, join me and we will not, not enslave the galaxy, not extract riches from the galaxy, not amass for ourselves a personal fortune and slave girls. He says, join me and we will put an end to this destructive conflict and bring order to the galaxy. Which is what the Empire is interested in doing. The Empire is interested in bringing order. And from what we see, like the actual things we see, it seems to be interested in bringing order through the least violent means possible. Right? So the idea, why do you have a battle? Why do you have a Death Star? Right? You have a Death Star to keep the planets in line and the, the outer systems in line so that you don't have to fight them and have wars. Right. This is literally what Moff Tarkin says. Right. The, and so the, the idea the, is, the, you, yeah, the Tarkin you, doctrine, right. The Tarkin doctrine, you use it once. Right. You know, you, you got to make an example of somebody. It's like dropping the bomb on uh, Hiroshima and Nagasaki. Right. You do it once that you don't have to do it again. Uh, you even see this in 
in Rogue One where Tarkin is getting into it with with Krennic and he says, like, look, we just want a statement, not a manifesto. Right. He wants Tarkin wants the least amount of violence possible to maintain order. And this is not a bad thing. I don't think, especially when compared with the alternative. Right. And the alternative is the Jedi Order, which is basically wrong about everything. Right. I mean, the, the Jedi are essentially wrong at every turn in everything they say. Right. They say this planet can't exist because it's in, you know, in the prequels because it's not in our archives. And of course it is. They say, uh, you know, Qui-Gon Jinn brings in. So, oh, we're going to we're going to I'm positive that this young kid Anakin is going to be great. You know, and he winds up raising Darth Vader. Uh, so the Jedi are wrong all the time. You know, the way Yoda abdicates his responsibility by going to hide away on Dagobah. And so what are the Jedi really offering you? And the answer is not very much. And the Old Republic is actually sclerotic, right? I mean, the Old Republic we see is not doing a very good job of governance of the of the galaxy. And so all things being equal, if you are trying to sort of govern a incredibly large system, so large that it encompasses a galaxy, what we what we see is that the Empire is probably the least bad of the options on offer. Okay. All right. Does that make sense to you? No, I, I follow you because I, I think like you, you, you highlighted the, the key selling point for the empire, which is order. I, th I think if I were, I'll say it, I would love to watch a film from the perspective of an imperial idealist, um, you know, circa episode four or episode five. Um, maybe not a moth, but, but you know, like a, a, a starship commander. Admiral Piet. Yeah, someone some like, <laughs> some, some, well, like um, uh, the 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 guy in uh, in Rogue One who you just mentioned. I, I, his name eludes me, but I, I, I believe in lore. He kind of worked his way up from um, the bottom, like the, the guy at the beginning of Rogue One. Director Krennic. Yes, yes, Director Krennic, who's wearing all white. Yes, um, he's not part of the core world's aristocracy. He's he's you know kind of a um, a hick in effect, and he's bothered by it on a socioeconomic level. But at the same time, he was able to rise up in that. Uh, that, that system, I would be very curious to hear from their perspective as to what they viewed as the the selling point of the empire. I, I I think it would be order. I think that if I if I were making a pitch for the empire, if I'm if I'm the press secretary for Palpatine or something like that, I would go. Um, you're going to have to have some authority here, and um, the authority in place is basically keeping galactic peace in place yes. uh, rather than having a series of factional warlords. So you can either have warlords and a few planets that are very free in between them that are probably fighting them constantly, or you can have a, uh, a galactic empire. Now, for the record, I am not a, a, an imperial apologist. I, I'm, I'm sure. not on that side, but I'm, I'm happy to play along well, with this. Well, so think, think about Tatooine, right? So in ta on Tatooine, you have... Uh, Mos Eisley with a spaceport, which is sort of under occupation. Things are basically okay for Uncle Owen and Aunt Beiru until they are caught harboring fugitives. And instead, who is it who is on the run from the Empire? It's the Huts and the smugglers and the crooks, right? So this is, this is again, suggesting to me that the Empire, in a day-to-day -day sense, is really functioning as the the galactic police force, right? And so, if you are smuggling spice, or you are a gangster and uh, pimp and thief, the way Job of the Hut is, then you fear the Empire. But if you are just the guy who owns the bar at Mos Eisley, the Empire is maybe an annoyance, but not more than that. So you're thinking? I, I think the phrase that you use in defense of Empire is that it's a dictatorship, but it's a, a dictatorship you can do business with. It's kind of the Pinochet of of galactic. Yeah, empires. which a lot of people didn't like that. But just as an objective fact, if you were to rank the 100 dictators of the last century by you know brutality. From from worst to least, Pinochet is down towards the bottom. Okay, he's not up by by Pol Pot, right? He's more <laughs> of a cuddly right. dictator. Right. Well, not not cuddly. No dictators are cuddly. Right, there aren't but, very many cuddly. But he was point. again. The, when I say a dictator, you can do business with that is a dictator who is uh, who is eyeing order and not some larger. Uh, ethnic or ideological goal, right? I mean, because that's where dictators get really brutal when they are not just interested in order, but they're they're out to prove a point about something, right? right. That's the, when you the get... idealist versus the prag pragmatist. The idealist yeah. will march you off to die because you're not part of the glorious, uh, right? Glorious, all encompassing. That's when you get the cultural revolution, right? Right. There, there is no cultural revolution under Pinochet. So then, is is Pal well? A, a couple of follow up questions here. Are you pro Sith? Is this merely the politics of the empire we're talking about, or do you also view the Sith as good as opposed to the Jedi? 
I've actually never really thought this through. Like, do we care about the Sith? I guess I don't really care about the Sith so much as I care about the Empire. Okay. I care about the the Empire itself, the the structure of the, the the Grand Moffs and the Moffs and the regional governors, and even the Emperor to his own degree, uh, and less about the Sith. Okay. But I guess that's because I don't really even know much about the Sith. I mean, do we? There, did you ever read? There was a, a great blog written in, in the beginning as a parody send up it was the darth vader's diary oh i remember this yeah and uh but by the end the guy who did it had like gotten really into it and he wrote like, essentially a three thousand word manifesto explaining the difference between the jedi and the sith view uh-huh and that where the Jedi view is this literally inhuman view of the world that, you know, we must have our hands off of it and never give in to passions and all. The Sith view of the world was that the life matters and life is messy and and important. And so we should muddle in it. We should we should get our hands dirty and try to live and, and to make make things beautiful. And uh I would say it was deeply convincing. The, the metaphysics of the Sith work better than the metaphysics of the Jedi. Well, yeah, I'll, I'll have to go back and read that because that, that is one of the problems I have with the Darth the, Side blog, I believe is what it was okay, called. The, yeah, the, the, the Darth Side blog. The Darth Side blog. Uh, yeah. I'll, I'll check that out because with in Star Wars, I find I've read some of the expanded universe. I've You know, there's uh, sure. hundreds of novels now. Sure. So it would, in, anybody that's read it, my hat's off, but I'm not one of them that's read the entirety of it. I have read a few of them where Darth Bane um, is sort of the 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 first character in, in Star Wars lore that basically narrows down the Sith to their system of of mentor and apprentice. Always two there are right. Always no. always two there are right. So prior to that, there's Sith civilization and there's Jedi civilization. Or there's the Republic and the Sith, but they're they're all, they're fighting for thousands of years. Um, and one of the problems I have with that series, well, it's it's interesting and it it does kind of walk you through this process of how the Sith enter this kind of dormancy period of of being gone for a thousand years, according to Master Yoda, whereas in fact they've been you know pulling the strings for a long time is th there's not really a coherent ideology put forth in the series um, and I and I've not found there maybe there isn't Star Wars um, that, that I've not read yet but I feel like you need to have some kind of pretense of positive action to have a coherent system ongoing for a long period of time so if it's just I enjoy being evil and twirling a mustache I don't feel like that has a lot of latent potential to last for centuries and centuries whereas if the debate were between say um, like an extreme pragmatist or a Machiavellian. And I see Palpatine at his best is Machiavellian. Uh, or, or actually Tarkin, I think you could straight up say is Machiavellian, right? As opposed to like Cicero or someone like that. Or you've, you've got, you know, action for the greater good versus parliamentary procedure and that kind of thing. I kind of see those being different takes on Sith versus Jedi. Yeah, I think that's, that's about right. Alderaan. Yeah, I feel like this is a very big data point that needs to be covered here <laughs> is that... Uh, uh, Grand Moff Tarkin, or I guess, I guess Darth Vader. No, hold on. It's Tarkin. Is it Tarkin? It's Tarkin. Tarkin. Yeah, I guess Vader's around, but Tarkin's the one that pulls the trigger on it, blows up a planet with millions of people. So that's a okay. If if you're the imperial, you're, you're the imperial press secretary here. What are you saying to a stunned and horrified galaxy that's witnessed a, a, an entire planet destroyed? So, so this is a very good question, right? Uh, if the things that Princess Leia tells us leading up to the destruction of Alderaan are true, then it is much worse than somebody like me thinks, right? And so what does she say? She says, uh, there's nobody there. There are no traitors there. They have no weapons. If all those things are true, that Alderaan is a peaceful planet with no weapons and nobody there who is part of the rebellion, then blowing up Alderaan is really bad. The problem is that everything that Leia has told the Empire, the Empire until that moment has been a lie. So she has said, uh, this is a diplomatic, when she's captured, this is a diplomatic mission. This is, you know, we're just on a mission of mercy. That's not what she's doing. She's smuggling the, the plans to the Death Star. Uh, when she is asked if she knows where the rebel base is, she says, no, I have no idea. When they finally threaten her with the destruction of Alderaan, she gives them the name of an abandoned base. So why is it that we assume that those other three facts that she tells us, the viewers, are also true? I, I mean, I just as as an audience, we have no reason to believe it. Right. But if it's a whole planet, I mean, I'm guessing that I mean, what, what's the ratio of people that are actively involved with well, the rebellion versus just civilians that are, you know, janitors sure. and, you know, But on the drivers. other hand, that 
that fundamentally changes it, right? I mean, our understanding of war is that when, you know, for instance, you have the Battle of Mosul, right? It's a terrorist stronghold. That does not mean that everybody in Mosul is a terrorist. But on the other hand, like it's a terrorist stronghold, you have this is war, right? This is what war looks like. And this is what all wars look like. That is different than the intentional targeting of a solely civilian population. I mean, you could say the same thing about the Death Star, to be honest, right? I mean, of, of all well, the people who are on the Death Star. it is explicitly a military. It's like building, destroying a battleship. It is. is but on the other city. hand, there are going to be doctors there. There are going to be janitors there. Like, not everybody on the Death Star is a stormtrooper, right? I mean, I am drawing a false equivalency here only to show that actually those two things are more on a continuum than they seem. Mm. And so it really all, I think, that the question of Alderaan really does come down to the question of whether or not Leia is telling us the truth about it. And I don't believe that as an audience we have any indication that we should believe what she's saying. Well, and I think, um, now I, again, as, as somebody that would be a, a patsy for the Jedi, uh, I'll I'll say that Alderaan would fit into the Tarkin doctrine regardless of whether or not Leia is telling the truth. So the Tarkin doctrine, for people unfamiliar with it, um, it, he actually has three points in the Tarkin doctrine. But I think for our purposes, there's really one big point, which is you've got an entire empire to lead. Um, it, it would be impossible to have a a navy sufficiently large to patrol the entirety of the galaxy at all times. It's way too big, way too economically crippling. You just can't do that. So you have to have pockets of Navy that are patrolling things periodically. But even then, you're still open to um, hit and runs and a stateless um, stateless tactical strategy. So um, resistance cells, right? So what he comes up with is the Tarkin Doctrine, which basically boils down to um, rule through fear of force as opposed to rule through force. Rule, rule through force would be we're going to have a, a, uh, a Star Destroyer posted at every single planet. And that, that Star Destroyer is actively taking you know, boots on the ground measures to bring the civilian population to heal. Um, fear of force is we make displays of force and then people knuckle under and are aware that we could use it. And by doing so, we're able to maintain minimal resources to pull this off and to further extrapolate that from his very orderly, uh, very Machiavellian interpretation of the universe. We're going to keep down um, the overall deaths to a minimum, because if we don't have this use of force to scare people and to heal, then we're going to have rebellions all the time. And there's going to be civil wars all the time. More people are going to die from that than from uh, strategic uh, displays of force. Yeah, no, I think that's I think that's correct. Of course, as you mentioned before, all of this is slightly belied by the fact that they can keep building Death Stars because if you can, if the economics of building a it's Death true. Star you are so easy, six years, then actually you could build a navy big enough to do all. <laughs> yeah, that is a good point. Yeah, because if, if yeah, yeah, the would, economics of Star Wars breaks down, I would say you can you can analyze many parts of Star Wars in ways that are rational, but not the economic structure. Yeah, uh, you could. Well, they they kind of get into that in uh, in Episode Four, and nobody. I enjoyed that. I enjoyed the whole like, oh, the Trade Federation has to talk to the Ombudsman about whether or not they're going to have. <laughs> Parliamentary procedure enable them like, ooh, cool. Like I enjoy that. I'm the only person that enjoyed that. I like I would love for them to be like they're talking about corn tariffs, and I'm like, go on. Yeah. Uh, but uh, but no, most of them don't. Um, I find so I think Tarkin and um, and your interpretation of Palpatine are interesting for the two figures that I think they most represent. I, I mentioned Machiavelli a minute uh, Machiavelli a minute ago, and uh, Machiavelli, um, who I think is perhaps given a bad rap and that I don't know that he would, I don't think he was a brutalist for the sake of brutalism, but Machiavelli, I think you can kind of, um, Mach, yeah, my, I feel like I'm saying that wrong. Um, I, with, with Machiavelli, you can, I think, summarize him as saying it's basically better to be feared than loved if you're a ruler. Uh, and he is the ultimate pragmatist. He is not concerned with um, deontology of uh, the method by which we achieve an outcome. He's interested in achieving the outcome period. So he's the ultimate pragmatist. Uh, and fear is a part of that toolkit. Violence is a part of that toolkit. Nothing is off limits to Machiavelli. Nothing's off limits to Tarkin. But according to Tarkin, if we take him at his word, which is dubious because he is a villain within the Star Wars universe, but if we take him at his word, he's interested in order and minimal death. Maximum peace, maximum order, minimal death. That's where Tarkin's coming from. Um, with Palpatine, one of the things you wrote in, um, in Defense of Empire is that Palpatine is, how did you phrase it, a, an esoteric Straussian what does that mean? Because I was very interested in, in what, what philosophical construct he represents. Yeah, I mean, so, so you know, Leo Strauss, I am not a student of Leo Strauss, but I am friends with many people who are. Uh, so this, this Straussian view, view of the world is that uh, 
the public good matters, right? And because the public good matters, lots of things, Machiavelli is himself, like the first Straussian, uh, you, almost anything is on the table so long as it is in pursuit of the public good, right? You can, you can lie, you can present things as being half true or untrue uh, because you're, you're doing it, again, in pursuit of trying to bring the most, the most good to the largest number of people. And I just, I just don't see a way to read the empire's actions except that way, right? I mean, the, the empire is not running around committing uh, genocide for no reason, Alderaan accepted, but again, we I, I would argue that we have good reason to think there was a reason for the destruction of Alderaan. Uh, and what is what is it exactly that the rebels want? There's no you never ever hear the rebels talk about what you know. What, do we want freedom? Do we want liberty? Do we want free speech? Freedom of religion? There's it's just we, we got to get rid of this empire. Well, then what? Right. And, and it does, especially since they're being led by a princess, which sounds like a monarchy. Right. Not not an elected government. What? I don't know. Do we think that that's any better than anything else? There's a couple of weird moral um, haziness issues throughout the Star Wars continuum. And it happens in the Old Republic and it happens during the days of the Empire, where in the Old Republic, we know that slavery exists because Anakin is a slave. Absolutely. Uh, and his mother is a slave. And that's one of the weird, weird, and I don't know whether they do and this And the Jedi totally accept it. Right. Because the, the, the Jedi position is like, well, it's uh, too bad, I guess, but we have to get back to Coruscant. And, uh, the, and they're not it doing it. It's literally like the prime directive from Star Trek. Yeah. Right. It's like, oh, we can't interfere in slavery. Right. And you would, you would think that the Jedi, as a moral order maintaining peace in the galaxy, I, I, and I, I guess then their their mandate or their, uh, their their remit would be merely the preservation of peace at all costs, including moral depravity such as slavery. Um, after the collapse of the Republic, we might um, I don't know perhaps the Empire bans organic slavery. I'm not sure. I don't know if it's covered, but nonetheless, though droids who appear to be to all intents and purposes sapient beings in the galaxy are slaves. So the Star Wars universe always has slavery in it. There's there's never a mo the only well, moment we, we have like a, a hint of not that is in Rogue One, where there is sort of a dro droids right character. But that's the first time we've ever seen that. So this is this is an interesting. I wrote a long piece about this too, uh, and it didn't occur to me till much later that when we see, first of all, I think it is undeniable that droids are essentially sentient beings. Yeah. Um, they literally have free will, right? They talk about R2-D2 as, oh, you're a feisty one. You're going to learn how to obey. You know, you have a new master now. Uh, C-3PO is terrified of being shut down and dying, right? They seem to even have some sort of like rudimentary religion where he says, thank the maker. Right. Right. You remember that? Uh, the rebellion seems heavily reliant on droids. In fact, their primary warfighter, the X-Wing, is built around having an R2 unit in it, right? If you look in the episodes four and five, the rebels are never without a reliance on droid. They are The droids are their doctors. The droids are the, the things running around in their bases. Everything they do is based on droid. You could say the rebellion is built on the backs of droids. By contrast, you see very, very few droids in the Empire. Uh, and the types of droids you tend to see are the little, like, uh, four-wheel things right. or the, the torture droid. Thing, yeah. Right. Much more like Roombas than sentient R2 units or, or C-3PO units. I've always thought that that was probably an accident on the part of Lucas, but a very telling accident. You know, he thought that he was incorporating the droids into the rebellion to show that the rebellion was cooler or something. And I, I actually think that this is part of, if you notice, in the, in the most recent movies, the First Order has given, been given a lot of droids. This is a thing which is not like totally, you know, because I'm looking out for it. Like, I see it all the time now. Oh, boy, the First Order has droids everywhere. And I think partially in, I mean, it's going to sound immodest. I think that everybody connected with Star Wars has basically read my piece. Yeah. And I think that part of what was done with the First Order was a response to that. Uh, because there is no way to read the First Order as being the good guys. Right. The they First are Order, very clearly Nazis. They are Nazis on a... Yeah. Big, absolutely. Yeah. And part of that is they, they include droid slavery in, in what they do. And in a way, I found that that 
as I said at the beginning, strengthened my original case. Like, you know, you can see now what the, the truly evil version of the Empire is the First Order. The fact that the First Order is so different from the Empire is is practically proof that the Empire is more or less benign, all things considered. So, so if, if I'm going to get into... Um, into Jonathan Last's mind here. It's it's sort of like maybe the rebels are fighting Kaiser Wilhelm and uh, Kaiser Wilhelm has some problems, but overall we're accepting World War One here, but an autocratic ruler. And when they bring down Kaiser Wilhelm, the, the force that steps into the ensuing vacuum is the Nazis. So you go That's... from like empire and autocracy to fascism and a yeah, much, much worse, that nastier that's, thing. I think that's right. And uh, I mean, the First Order has, the First Order is not interested in order, right? I mean, they the, the First Order, as we said at the beginning, the First Order has like larger ideological goals, mm -hmm. right? Uh, they want to extermination and purity and all sorts of stuff like that. They are not looking to end a destructive conflict and bring order to the galaxy. Right, which is what what Vader was was looking for. Yeah. Okay. Um, when, when we're watching the original uh, episodes four through six, I, I would not expect all of the military tacticians to be formulating a a political statement of what we're doing this for. I would expect them to be dealing with the strategic elements of how to bring down the Death Star, et cetera, and so forth. Um, presumably, they're going to just bring back the Republic. Uh, the, the, I would assume that that's the default state, is we're going to topple the Emperor, reinstate the Senate, and just go back to whatever we were doing um, and hopefully clean it up. Um, if they had posited an alternative, or if that were happening off scenes, would you then view them as a force for good or as a misguided force for good, or how would you interpret it? I didn't have to see what their plans were. I mean, I, I would just say, for guys like you and me, that would have been catnip. If we could add an extra hour to both episode four and oh, episode yeah. five, I would have loved. Where that. We just have rebellion people sitting talking about policy. In the I, I would have, yeah, I would have loved that if, if you, you've got like Princess Leia basically outlining. I, I don't know. Like, like, like if you if you, look, if you go back to the older, uh, this is how we're gonna draw the the parsec dividing right. lines for the sign me. Yeah, up for yeah, yeah. yeah. Like, I, I went down the rabbit hole on the Tarkin Doctrine, and I was getting into oversector. Like, I, know, <laughs> I now know what a moth is. Uh, and, and, and for for people that are unfamiliar, basically, one of the other uh, three provisions of the Tarkin Doctrine is that Tarkin goes, "Hey, we've got all of these sectors, and the rebels basically just jump between sectors, so that whenever they're about to get pursued by imperial forces, they go." into some other imperial commander's area and they trigger a turf war and they 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 it's it's like going across state lines if you've stolen fruit or something they're able like to the dukes of, of hazard escaping yes, by are, jumping over the county and, line and, and he goes what if we do this we're going to make a new super auditory system called over sectors where we're going to draw lines around the trouble systems and the hot spots and we're going to give them their own um, a, a, you know, top level commanders that only report to the emperor. And that's what a moth is. And then eventually he becomes grand moth. So there you go. That's what a moth is. And what a grand moth is. He's the top moth. This is so this all falls under the category of world building. And I think it's something that all of us sci fi nerds just respond to on a deep level, whether or not it's in sci fi. Do you remember the Russell Crowe movie Gladiator? Yeah. Right. So if you watched the DVD, the DVD had a whole bunch of deleted scenes, many of which involved Connie Nielsen sitting and talking with the various Roman senators about things like grain shortages and tax policy. And you can see exactly why these were cut from right. the final product. And yet when I watched them, I was just like, give me more. Right. Yeah, yeah. Because it was just this fabulous world building about what what life was really like in Imperial Rome. And by the same token, I would have I would have killed for more of that uh, in the Star Wars universe. Well, I'm, I, I don't know what it is. There's some part of my brain that's fascinated by um, just organizational taxonomy. I'm yeah. really, really fascinated by it. So, like, I, lo I love figuring out what a moth is. That's great. Uh, I love, like, trying to figure out, um, like, it's, I think Star Trek, I think the Federation's basically the European Union because it's got a, a central bureaucratic structure, but all of the individual planets still have some level of functional yeah. autonomy. Vulcan is operating as its own thing. There's not, they're not departments of France. They're not states. They're their own country, but they have a unified, uh, you know, Navy in effect and things like that. So it's basically the European Union. And then getting into the Star Wars universe, which is I think a little bit more messy, uh, or at least has a lot more books you have to sift through to figure that out. Yeah, I, I enjoy all of that kind of stuff. Um, Dooku, are you a Dooku fan then? Are, are, do you think the separatist movement's a good thing? So it's which we pitted hard. against the empire, right? Yeah. So it was. It's very hard to know whether Dooku was a dupe or not. 
Yeah. Right. I mean, did Dooku... Well, he did get duped at the end. He's for sure a dupe. He's for sure a dupe at the end. But when he is talking to the the phrase... This was, this was like the the worst, most on the nose, George Lucas. We we want an unlimited right to capitalism right. and free trade. As if he was trying to Clearly channel the Gingrich guy. or something. Oh, well, he must be bad. Right. Uh, he did, doesn't he call uh, 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 Grievous's ship the invisible hand? Something like, like he's that. He's literally yeah. like, take that, Adam Smith. Ha <laughs> <laughs> ha, I got you. But again, it's not clear that the Trade Federation guys don't believe in all this stuff, right? I mean, the, the the Trade Federation guys who I think are now, we can look back and say, are sort of problematically uh, portrayed as certain sort of ethnic groups. Right, right. There's a, yeah, there's a few things in retrospect, uh, yeah. But, Ditto Gungans. Right, so those guys uh, seem to actually believe in those things, right? And so that is, I don't know, maybe it's okay. I mean, what it does emphasize, though, is that the the heart of the imperial argument, which is that the old republic was not functional, right? A republic which can't adjudicate these things and allows one group of planets, which is, you know, maybe the Trade Federation is really the Trade Federation. Maybe they're just a cartel like OPEC. Um, but if OPEC decides they're going to wage war on Nigeria or something, uh, Will any order that can't stop OPEC from doing that and instead says, well, we're going to send some observers. We'll send these two Jedi over there to take a look at it. Uh, we're going to send a couple of Buddhist monks. That doesn't work. That's not functional. That is not a, a form of government which is actually doing much good for people. Mm. Yeah, I think um, it, if, if I were to put myself in the shoes of an imperial sympathist at the onset of the empire, I think it would look very much like um, everybody, when, every, when when you're in high school, everybody's seen that really big cartoon of um, a bunch of trusts that are like waddling through the Senate and the people are up in the balcony and they can't get into it. But it's all these fat cats that are doing it. So kind of the idea of uh, um, robber barons run amok. Yeah. I think that's the interpretation of, at least from the empire's perspective and, and, and its adherence, that's the interpretation of the old republic is that it's very much... All of the stuff we hear about lobbyists, that's that on steroids. All of the stuff you hear about corrupt politicians and politicians being bought off and not serving the interest of the people, it's reached its apotheosis under the old republic. Yeah, and to the Jedi are part of that, that, right? I mean, this is the other thing. The Jedi, everything we see about the Jedi suggests the fate of the republic should not be entrusted to these guys, right? I, I heard a conspiracy theory a few, a few weeks ago, which I like and I think would have been a better execution of the prequels. The conspiracy theory is that originally George Lucas wanted Mace Windu to be the secret Sith. And I think that would have oh. been a far better explanation for why Anakin turns. Because in, in, in episode three, the, the Emperor is basically like, join me and I will save your girlfriend. And he's like... Okay, there's like three seconds of, of thought process where he's like, yeah, we have right. interstellar travel, but I'm afraid she's going to die in childbirth. I'll do anything. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And it's it's like it's a very it's a weird like, you know, maybe there's some stuff going on with a force that we can't see, but it's a very weird and quick turn. Whereas if Mace Windu had turned out to be the Sith apprentice and he's working in tandem with uh, with Palpatine to do this, well, then very clearly the Jedi Order would be corrupt. Dooku, in his earlier statement that the you know the the Order's been corrupted when he's talking to uh, to Qui Gon Jinn or not to, to, to Obi Wan Kenobi and Anakin when he captures them that it's been corrupt, he would be very accurate in that interpretation. Yeah, and uh, and then Anakin would be I think be able to look at it and go, well, these are both run by Sith, uh, and it would have it would have you know be, been able to to bring it down in, in a way where we could. Um, understand that the Jedi were not wholly good, uh, but had severe institutional problems with which portended their destruction. Yeah, I think that's I think that's right. Yeah. Can I ask you a question? Yeah. Where are you on Rogue One? Uh, OK. I going back to my films that are executed well versus films that I enjoyed. It's kind of on the flip side for me. I watched it. I can tell that it's a very good film. I think it was written far better, The Force Awakens, or, or, or and, and much better than uh, The Last Jedi. That said, I just didn't enjoy it that much. It, just, it wasn't as much fun for me. So I've watched it, and I, it was really good. Glad I saw it. Glad it exists. Definitely part of the canon. When I have children, I will make them watch it. But I don't have a big desire to go back and watch it again. Whereas I I enjoyed Luke Skywalker in uh, in, in The Last Jedi, and I enjoyed, uh, I enjoyed just the sheer tub-thumping fun of... Uh, of The Force Awakens. So Rogue One, yay. I, I, I kind of feel similar to like that about Mad Men. 
Like I can tell Mad Men is a very good program. Seems to be very well written, very well acted. I'm just I'm not that into it. I like John Hamm. I like Christina Hendricks, but I've just I've never been captivated. So here is my most controversial Star Wars opinion. More controversial even than The Empire is good. I think Rogue One is the best of all the Star Wars movies. Okay. All right. And I think a lot of film buffs would agree with you. I fully recognize that it's too soon to tell. Like we need to wait at least a decade. I mean, the, the, the fact that if you go back and watch A New Hope, that today we're now, what, 40 years after, right? We're closing in on the 50th anniversary of The New Hope. And that movie does not read like a museum piece. Mm. It is alive and vibrant. It is, it is just a, a piece of filmmaking that is still as virile and electric today as it was the very first day it came out. That's an amazing, amazing accomplishment. I think people tend to overlook yeah. how big an accomplishment that is. So that's why I'm not going to like jump over that great thing just yet with, with Rogue One. But I wouldn't be surprised if in a decade from now we view Rogue One as the great grown-up Star Wars movie because it is a movie about loss and duty and shades of gray and man it is something else i, I think, love it i think the film buffs definitely will yeah uh, and, and i and i think the thing that i really enjoy about it is that it does give a lot more emotional gravity to the death star yeah which is completely undermined by uh, the force awakens and, and that one it's like well, okay again we've got how many of these things can we build we, we build them they're, they're apparently pretty cheap maybe you can both have death stars and have mutually <laughs> assured destruction and Jin urso may be the great female character in star wars so at the very least she's one b underneath princess leia but again, this is maybe why I I hate the character of Ray so much, and you're really? not allowed to say that. Yeah, yeah, right. If you don't like Ray, it's just again, because you're I a have, sexist. You know, what, what am I? What am I? You don't like women or something right. like that. One one of my film buff friends, who's very very knowledgeable about all of this, would share your opinion, and he would he would voice the same irritation that if he says this, people call him sexist. I like Ray, but I'm I'm kind of I, I am I'm going to say in terms of film analysis, I'm lowbrow. Um, in terms of sci-fi analysis, I'm pretty good. But in terms of just the composition of a film, I'm I'm not an elite. Um, he looks at Ray and goes, there's no character growth and there's no flaws. And so he sees a consistent, um, perfect character from the gate that he finds very boring and very monolithic. And what, what do you not like about yeah, it? Yeah. And, and there's nothing interesting about her either. Like they're, they're, you're, you're every, not, you're not touched by the, the sort of uh, marooned orphan? No. No, I'm not. And, uh, you know, to be honest... I was never a Luke guy either, right? So I was a Han guy. I much prefer Han yeah. Solo to Luke. I think Luke is far and away young Luke, at least as you see in, in episode four, is a much more boring character than Han is. Uh, the young Luke doesn't well, really the, change farm, as much. He's a farm kid from Kansas, he's right? He's a farm he's kid the every, from Kansas. He's the everyman character. And Ray is like that, but, but with all of the growth that even that Luke has sanded off of and then just sort of idealized. And, you know, like Luke screws up. Right is not everything right touches is perfect and great. And it it lowers stakes. She's like it's like Hulk Hogan. Right. If you did. Were you a wrestling guy growing up? No. But thank you for thinking I might have been. Well, you know, so Hulk Hogan in the height of Hulkamania basically just beat everybody. And he took all the drama and stakes out of wrestling because, well, you know, like, of course, he's going to beat King Kong Bundy because he's Hulk Hogan. That's kind of like what Ray. Yeah, of course, she's gonna win this fight. She, she's Ray. This is what she does. And, and there's there's some uh, you know sci-fi foibles there as well. Where Kylo Ren, who's clearly had training, he's trained under Luke Skywalker, and and now or then later trains under Snoke, is being bested by a young woman that received her lightsaber three weeks ago. Yeah, and seems to be equal to him in the task. And you can kind of the only things I can kind of come up with are maybe. A theory I'm working on, I think maybe the, the force actually increases with each generation or your your, your propensity to, to deal oh, with is, the force. Is her midichlorian count being concentrated? Exactly. Exactly. So I'm thinking <laughs> the, the midichl- something about galactic temperature has, is increased or decreased to make it more fortuitous for midichlorians. And so perhaps the like the beginning, thresh- but this is me trying to, to, to retcon what I see are some glaring errors in, in the film because presumably you need training in order to wield a lightsaber effectively against somebody. Like I wouldn't go fight an Olympic gold medalist in, in fencing with the sword that I just picked up and assume I would be okay. That is true. You know, I, I find the the disappearance of midichlorians from the canon and they, they aren't airbrushed out but there's simply something that no one nobody will them. ever yeah. speak of. And if you if you say midichlorian, everybody just sort of turns yeah, around. Yeah, I, I, I have a problem with it. That was such great. a terrible misstep too because ultimately 
Star Wars is a fantasy epic in space. It is not, I mean, it's really not science fiction. It's speculative fiction, yeah. and they're both no, in the it's, same it's family. It's a space opera, not but, science but yeah, fiction. It's, it's, I mean, you could have, it wouldn't have done as well, I think, but you could have called it Space Wizards. Yeah. And, and if you called all the Jedi wizards, it would have been exactly the same. And in fact, people would understand what they are more intuitively. Um, now we understand it's baked into the culture. But if we go back to like 1978, if you called them wizards, everybody Doesn't would Uncle know. Owen call Ben Kenobi a wizard? Maybe. I, I believe he, very, he very calls likely. Ben Kenobi oh, that old wizard up in the Yeah. And, I, and I'm fine with that. And the force is magic. And that's and I'm fine with that. I enjoy that. Uh, when they pull midichlorians in and they're like, hey, we're going to try and rationalize how this clearly <laughs> magical system works. Like, why are you why are you bothering with that? That seems just like such an unnecessary step. And you, and I don't need thing. to know Harry Potter's blood type. So Lucas was willing to go back and change the things he got wrong, right? This is why he tried to make it so that Han shoots at the same time as Greedo and add more explosions. And why can't we go back and just take the midichlorians out, right? It's not like we are against, in principle, the idea of going back and fixing these things. Right. Yeah. So, and which and I leads can't me to one anything my... that would be changed as a result of the no, entire not, series. No, literally nothing gets changed. You just take out the one midichlorian account, right? You probably yeah, have all the two could, scenes. Could, if, we, if we were in the Star Wars universe, could we could we develop a midichlorian supplement company? Like have like a pharmaceutical <laughs> company where you eat these vitamins and you're more likely to get midichlorians? <laughs> we wind up having, you know, there'd be another company that does tests on how to cheat when they're doing the midichlorian testing at work. Yeah. Right. Yeah. You want to how to cheat the midichlorian testing. Right. The, the, yeah. The Jedi Council has that. You've got to take that test. See yeah. how your midichlorians are doing. Yeah. Uh, and which brings me to another of the, my great hopes for uh, Disney's ownership of the Star Wars universe is that at some point after George Lucas moves along to the undiscovered country, which I hope is a long time from now, we will get the original theatrical cuts of the, the first two movies because you can't get them anymore. Yeah. Um, you can find sometimes old laser discs for like three hundred dollars which have the theatrical cut uh if you still have a functioning laser disc player and right. then you're getting it like 420i or something otherwise you're getting that weird version where like there's like now singers at most Isley cantina yeah because right, that, that was the big thing prior to the prequels was um and, and for that i think lucas just wanted to cash in because yeah. you know the, the originals uh four through six come out and then in the i guess the mid to late 90s um, maybe early the 90s. Special editions. Yeah, the special. And it was just completely meaningless scenes that were added involving questionable Solo CGI. stepping over Jabba's tail. Right. right. Having Jabba show up in Mos Eisley is offensive. The whole idea of Jabba is that he's so big and fat and powerful that everybody comes to him. Yeah. He doesn't get out of his little palace to go to somebody else. He's Jabba the Hutt. Job of the freaking hut. So, yeah, I hope that we wind up in a world where we get to choose which version of the Star Wars that we want to see someday. Yeah, I would do that. And then I'd probably do the hatchet. Is it the machete cut or the hatchet cut? The machete. machete the machete order, yeah, right? The machete orders. Sure. I think what I, I'm, I'm already thinking about how to raise the kids. Yeah. In terms of, in terms yeah, do you have kids? Of, no, but I'm, I'm still hopeful, hopeful that as, as yeah. an aging sci-fi fan, I can trick someone into reproducing with me. You know, me. so I... Uh, this, I think, is very telling. So I introduced my oldest to Star Wars when he was seven years old. And he fell really hard into the first two movies. Mm -hmm. And I only showed him the first two. And you mean chronologically? Like when you say first two, do you mean uh, episode, episode one four? Two? Episode four and episode gotcha. five. Yeah, yeah. Was super duper into it. Loved it. And then uh, we went to see episode seven which is the the force awakens and he was pretty into he was really excited to go to it we went we saw it and he was like yeah it's okay we went to then the the, the last jedi or whatever all right the, the rian johnson one and we walked out and he goes that didn't make any sense and he has zero interest in going to see the next one in wow. a couple weeks when it comes out and my kid is an 11 year old boy in America. I don't think there was a single 11 year old boy in this entire country who was not vibrating with excitement at the prospect of seeing Return of the Jedi. Do you? And I just worry that Star Wars has wasted its cultural capital here and lost an entire generation of fans who, by, by giving it this really subpar trilogy, who now just regard it as, eh, yeah, it's okay. I, I'm hoping that Disney will. Like, I, like, I've, I've just watched the second episode of The Mandalorian, which I enjoy. It's do you like it? How yeah. is it? I've not seen it it's yet. Fun. I'm it's, looking it's, forward so, to it. So it is the 
the Western spinoff, like like a space Western spinoff of sp- of, of space fantasy, right? Uh, it's about a, a bounty hunter on the edge of the galaxy. You've probably seen the Baby Yoda memes. They're adorable. Yeah. Um, I'm enjoying it so Werner far. Werner Herzog. Yeah. Yeah. I want to learn more Werner Herzog. Herzog. A man incapable of casual conversation at a birthday party. I can't. Can you can you imagine talking to him about laundry? I can't. I, like, I could see him talking about laundry, but like invoking Lord Did Byron. Did you see the Met last night? <laughs> uh, they reminded me of my grim mortality. <laughs> <laughs> when I saw them and thought about how we are also on an orb that is fated to die in a cold and slow universe. Yeah, let, let everything. He's so um, right. But I, I, I'm enjoying that. It's basically what I want from Star Wars as a TV show. That's fine. My fear is that eventually we're going to have like wacky Detective Yoda, the early years, where they'll come up with ev- like all of the spinoffs you can think of that have happened in other sitcoms and things. They will do that in the Star Wars universe and it won't be, it'll, just, it'll be proliferate rather than quality. That's what I'm worried about. So, but before we wrap up, on that note, what do you hope will happen with uh, with the last Skywalker, which comes out in about two weeks from when we're recording? Yeah, um, this is this is. I literally don't hope for anything from it. <laughs> I, I will see oh. it out of a sense of duty, and I'm kind of sad about this. Yeah. Like I used to really care about Star Wars. My God, I mean, I I remember when the the very first trailer for the Phantom Menace was attached to Meet Joe Black. A terrible movie starring Claire Forlani, Anthony Hopkins, and and Brad Pitt. I like that you live with Claire Forlani, though. Yeah. And I I not only went to see Meet Joe Black on opening night, just to see <laughs> the Phantom Menace trailer, right. but I then stayed because after all the way through the end credits, the projectionist said, "Hey guys, I'm going to run the Phantom Menace trailer again." And showed me, like, and I was. I was an adult with a job and an apartment when I did this. So I was not just like some weirdo 15 year old. And now I can, as I said, I just barely get it up to to go see it. I'll do it out of a sense of duty because I know I have to. I hope that as much as anything, I hope that this allows us to close the door on the Skywalker family aspect of this universe forever. And move on to other things because, again, I think Rogue One points to how to successfully do this franchise in the future. And I think the success of Marvel shows it, too. So the Marvel movies, what they have finally figured out is that you can make any genre of movie using superheroes. They don't all have to be superhero movies. You can have film noir, Mm. you can have buddy cop comedies, you can have action, you can have thriller. You can do it all because you just have these interesting characters. There's no reason you couldn't do that in Star Wars. There's no reason we couldn't get the Tag and Binks. Wait, so do you want the Wacky Yoda Detective series? I don't want Wacky Yoda Detective, but I wouldn't mind Tag and Binks. Okay. So did did you ever read Tag and Binks? No. This little tiny graphic novel, which is essentially Rosencrantz and Guildenstern are dead, set in the Star Wars universe. Okay. And so there are these two guys, Tag and Binks. A lot of talk about probability and flipping coins, as I recall from that that work. Who are, so Tag and Binks are low-level stormtroopers who find themselves sort of in the middle of every important moment in the Star Wars universe and are just trying to, like, get out. And they're basically, like, stoner types. And it's hysterical. I would say it's one of the, the very funny little byproducts of Star Wars. There's no reason we couldn't get... Uh, a one and a half hour Disney Plus version of Tag and Banks, which exists outside of the canon, and that's the other thing: not everything has to be canon, mm. right? This is this is the the genius of comic books uh, is that you can just tell interesting stories. They don't all have to be part of some giant continuum, and it's okay to go and replay another version of a story. And if some nerd somewhere in the internet says, but wait a minute, that's not possible because the learner in the just no, we're just telling an interesting story. So find interesting stories and tell them well. And you can use all of the characters in the Star Wars universe and a bunch of new characters who have been dreamt up along the way, like Ahsoka and Dr. Afra, And you can keep telling stories with them as long as you concentrate on the story. Wonderful. Well, on that note, we'll finish up. Jonathan, thank, thank you so much. Thank you. Recently, Myself and my friend Nick Spaduti, fellow comedian, we went to the Wookiee homeworld, the planet Kashyyyk, yeah. and I loved it. What a glorious planet. What did you think? 
I thought it was okay. I got to be honest. I'm a little bit afraid of heights. Yeah. And I really don't like uh, trees. You're not a tree guy. I and like, like for real. You're not a tree guy. No, like genuinely. We've, like even on Earth, you don't like trees. You don't the like parks. Is, I'm fine with trees being there, but if I wanted to live with trees, you move to Portland. I'd be somewhere with yeah. trees. I'm you, in New York. You live for in New York reason. City. Yeah. yeah, you live in a very like you, the trees are all in very manicured specific locations. Exactly. Whereas on Kashyyyk. It's it's the trees planet, yeah, and to a lesser extent the Wookies who are they're just living there, yeah, they're just hanging out, yeah, and they're building. I mean, they're building their trees. And, I mean, like you know, they get like a TGA Fridays inside of a redwood. Like it's all of it is the trees are predominant, which I love trees. So I, I I thought it was a stunning planet, and I thought the weather was very clement. A lot of people complain it's damp. I like it. No, it didn't didn't bother me. Yeah, no, no. weather wise, I was fine. It's not cold. No, it's I mean it's chilly, but it wasn't like it never got like biting cold. You know. Glad I brought my jacket. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, Which you got a lot of compliments Everybody on. Everybody loved. Everybody thought your jacket was very stylish. You, oh, you know. Apparently, you're you're stylish on any planet, but oh. the Wookiee homeworld in particular. I just want to say, that was sweet. The only the only thing that I had a problem with while I was there, which is nothing against Kashyyyk, is just the fact that we were doing early morning drive time. Um, <sighs> we're, we, you know, the, the, the podcast is new. Alienating the audience has is, is only been out for a couple of months. We've got we've to go around and promote it. One of the ways you do this in the world of comedy is you go on morning zoo shows. Yeah. And uh, that's, you know, you pick up listeners that way. And we were doing that. And that's that's fine. That's nothing, again, nothing against Kashyyyk. It just means that you and I had to get up really early. And it's then, also the time difference right. is a whole thing. And so realistically, we were waking up at like... I guess 1 a.m. our time? Yeah, it was very... It took me a long time to get used to that. We were sleeping during what we would normally be like dinner. I I don't know. We were only there for a week and a half. So by the time we adjust, we're done. That's exactly what Which is how that works. Yeah. It's... Yeah. Um... That said, though, you know what? It was fun. It was a little long. like usually when we when you and I have done morning zoo shows in the past, they usually have us on for like half an hour. Mm-hmm. We talk about like, hey, we're going to be performing at the the Laugh Factory or whatever. Uh, and they had us on for about two hours every day, so it was a lot of time. As far as the shows we've done so far, I think Frick Frack and the Judge felt like yeah. my favorite. You know what? And I'll say what I enjoyed about Frick Frack and the Judge. A lot of those morning zoo shows that we go on, it's usually like. You know, Jerry B and the Barracuda. There's always like the wacky animal character. Mm-hmm. Whereas on Kashyyyk, yeah. the wacky animal character is the protagonist and the sidekick is a stentorian judge. Mm-hmm. It's usually the judge is usually their sidekick. He was very, very narrow. I felt like you. It felt like a lot of you I saw in there, he which was- I liked. Tough but fair. Yeah. With really good analysis. I, I enjoyed that. It was a great show. Uh, I, yeah. No, I, 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 I think we thrived on that. Can mm-hmm. I say that? I felt like we thrived on the show. Oh, yeah. Oh, no. We did great. Like, we're, I'm, I haven't looked up the stats recently. We're on Libsyn. That's the, the host that we use for the show. Mm-hmm. Uh, I'm going to look it up. But, like, uh, I think my guess is by the end of December, probably a quarter of our listeners will be Wookiee. That's most likely what I thought as well, based on how well we were received. Yeah. And the fact that they put our pictures just about everywhere. Yeah. No, they were good about that. But the other reason that we're probably going to have a lot of Wookiees listening to the program I mean, is that, well, because we're, we're now, you're we permanently involved with several Wookiees, uh, which uh, I got it is going to help. I mean, it can't hurt. They've all got big families. They talk a lot. Okay. So when you're not in the trees... And the you, you tend to try to find your way through the jungleish sort of area of Kashyyyk, and which is all of it. Yeah, and they have well, they're not really food trucks; they're more like food carts. Yeah, they're they're like if you can imagine like one of those ski gondolas, except it can climb. Yeah, that's yeah, what yeah. they have for cars, and they've got these f- like food tree gondolas that Drop are really good. Off. They don't we, talk about that in the brochure, but their 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 food carts are great. Anyway, I <sighs> they're empanadas. I would not have guessed empanadas, but they have great empanadas. Anyway, yeah, I'm sorry. No, it's fine. So, Tarful almost got hit. Yeah. By a fallen food gondola. Food, food gondola. I suppose. Yeah. And you and grabbed I him. Pulled him out of the way. By his bandolier. Yeah. You grabbed him and you pulled him back. You yanked him. And that was, I got to say, I was impressed. Anyone would do that, though. That wasn't just me. I was just closer. I was way closer than you were. You were still on the other side by yeah. the garbage can. Yeah. I reached over, grabbed him, pulled yeah. him back, and, and like caught him. He fell on top of me. I got kind of hurt because he's heavy. Yeah. But I was fine and yeah. he was fine. And only the guy in the gondola died. Right. Still kind of feel bad about that. Sure. But there's nothing I could have done about nothing that. Nothing you one, could have done about that. It. it would not have been possible. No. Yeah. But. I saved Tarful, and now he owes you a life, a life debt. debt yeah, which, forever. Which I don't think 
it, I told him was fine. You were very magnanimous about that. I tried to. You be. were very magnanimous because because he like he's saying, and I, I don't do. I'm not very good at Wookie, but he's based on the the Google Translate that I had. He's saying like, I owe you a life debt. This is part of my culture. I am now uh, like like it. it I I don't want to say servant. That's not quite the right word. But he no. he has to. He's your protector. Yeah. Right. Uh, and you're you're saying like, hey, buddy. Look, it's, it's cool. fine. Yeah. It's it's no really just like why don't you buy us dinner? Buy us dinner. That's we're square. I, yeah, I, I would have been fine with that. Yeah, yeah. I, all of the but no, were he very was, he was emphatic that he is now uh, in your. He's like your thrall forever. It's like it's yeah. like we picked up a Wookie sidekick, uh, like a cool Wookie sidekick, and that was fine until we went to the funeral for the gondola guy, and then we met Wolfero, mm-hmm. who. I also accidentally, well, because the hearse almost hit him, and, and, and I you pulled him, jumped in front of the hearse and shoved him out of the way. Well, first of all, I I, I kind of like there's a tree. If you, I don't know if you remember, but it was really there's close trees to everywhere. A tree. Yes, well, of course it was. Well, we're it was really on Kashyyyk. Where are we not close to a tree? It was tree. like a climbing hearse. Yeah, and I was it was like, a gondola hearse. This is another thing they don't tell you. All of the hearses <laughs> look like ski gondolas that can climb. That's true. Yeah, and so I pulled him out of the way because it was going up. Words too fast. Uh huh. And the only person that died was the one inside the gondola. <laughs> yeah. They, you know, they could do a little bit more with their gondola safety. Here, the funny thing from my perspective mm. is I, first of all, I don't feel great about this, but I didn't feel like we needed to go to the funeral in the first part because mm-hmm. we didn't know that guy, right? It was no, terrible, but, but like I, we saw it happen. Yeah. I, okay. I guess. But like, but we're, you pull, okay. So you shove, um, Wolf Waro, I think. You should. Sh- Wolf Pharaoh. Wolf Pharaoh. But it's one of those Wookiee. Yeah, it's a. Oh. Yeah, Wolf Pharaoh. You, fu- you want to pull- try one more time? Wolf Pharaoh. Wolf Pharaoh. Yeah. You pull him out of the way, and he gives you this look, and your face fell. Yeah. You looked at him, and you went, oh, no. I had already seen the look once. Yeah. The life debt look. W- and 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 Tarful gave me that same exact look. Who came to the funeral with us, well, because yeah. he goes everywhere with you now. And now so does Wolf Arrow. Yeah. So you've got two Wookiees now. And uh, uh, yeah, it was, I was like, this, first of all, I thought it was hilarious. Because I was like, first of all, awesome that we've got two Wookiee sidekicks now. But also, how uncannily unlikely is that that you would not only have one life debt, but two in the same trip? I mean, I, the probability of that's so low. Now, the problem is, we shouldn't have went to the hospital with the hearse driver. Mm-hmm. Who did survive? Who did survive? Well, I, we, we wanted to check on Wolfwaro because, you know, you had to, you had to pull him Wolf out Waro. of the way. Wolfwaro. You wanted to pull him out of the way. Yeah, we went to the hospital. Um, well, hold on. We went there because this is partly on you, yeah. right? This is partly on you. I agree. Because we had some time to kill. Yeah. We, we've got several hours until we're going to go on... Um, the, what was it? the next one was Gary and the Judge? I can't remember what the next show we were going to be. Still on. the Judge? Was it? Well, yeah, but it's always the Judge. It's always the Judge. Um, we had several hours to kill. Was that Tuesday? That was Tuesday. So Gabe, Gabe and the Judge. So we're still we're still on Earth time. So we're going to be up for hours anyway. So we're mm-hmm. not going to go back to the hotel, right? Mm-hmm. I wanted to go to Hooters, and you wanted to go do jokes at a hospital. Yeah. Um, to you know, spread goodwill and all that, which is delightful. Uh, and then once the gondola accident happened, you're like, well, let's just take the guy there, make sure he's okay, and we'll do some stand-up and an improv sketch for anybody that wants to watch. And I'm like, all right, well, let's do this now. Well, so what happened was, I think we got mixed up, Heaton, because the guy that was in the gondola hearse died. Oh, okay. We brought him to the hospital. We thought he would make it. Right. Died. Yeah. They were doing surgery at the same time. On who we would find out later was Chewbacca. Uh-huh. And the they, doctor. Which which that's partly on them. Because yeah. they really should have better signage as mm-hmm. to where you are in the hospital. Because the whole thing looks like a jungle. Yeah. Which is, I gotta say. That is true. I gotta say, I prefer it to a regular, ho- like an American hospital. With like a lot of like bright lights and hard edges. Well, because they didn't question you about getting those meds. Yeah. There were a lot of reasons that it was awesome. Because uh, I just kind of came in. I was like, hey, I'm in town. I can't sleep. And they're like, you know what you need? And I was like, I'm guessing you're going to give me some CBD. And they were like, yep. <laughs> so they were giving me these brownies with CBD and THX or THC. I don't know how it works. Anyway, it was good stuff. Mm-hmm. But we're, we ended up basically wandering into surgery. True. Which you would not do in an American hospital or even a British hospital. But we didn't realize it. It was just behind some vines. Yeah. 
Yeah, yeah, yeah. It was a Vine section, and yeah. the and this is a weird thing too. I think that because Wookies are there's so much fur that it's just sort of assumed you're going to be. It's not going to be a sterile environment. So that uh, that Doctor Longera Junior. Yeah. Long, yeah, Doctor or Longara, Doctor Longara uh, Junior, Longara, yeah. Doctor Longara Junior starts Longara. starts choking on an empanada. Yeah, and you give him the Heimlich because it was the right thing to do. Yeah, but I knew it. That was one I I, I thought about. I legitimately thought about just letting him die, and it was because I knew that if you I saved third him, third life debt. And then well, they uh, pulled this uh, other bullshit. I would have done it, except I was smoking that cigar. That's true. And, and you weren't even allowed near the Yeah, near I the was dog. like, I don't know what the etiquette is here. Can I go through the surgery room with the cigar? Because I'm not putting it out. They asked you not to. Yeah. and I, Well, and I, I didn't go. So I'm still fine. But they tried to pull this bullshit where they go, oh, well, you saved the doctor uh-huh. that was performing surgery. Appendicitis. On this or appendectomy. Patient, appendectomy. On, on Chewbacca. On, on Chewbacca. So thus, you've saved them both yeah. and you add two more life debt it felt it feels more like i'm the one doing the life debt right can Which, i be honest i'm with you on this one i think longara makes sense dr longara makes sense you gave him the heimlich he would have choked on that empanada that's true right he then with remarkable turnaround speed yeah. uh, performs the appendectomy on chewbacca yeah and saves her life now in my mind she should have a life debt to, to him, him and he should have life debt to you but they were all emphatic that, and I, I don't understand the rules here, but nope, they both owe you a life debt. So you got four. And then, I mean. Well, then I was like, man, this has been a crazy day. You know where we should go? Hooters, which I want to throw this out here. I really do just like the wings because I yeah. Wookiee women aren't doing anything for me. So I just wanted to go hang out in a familiar environment. And so we go there. I'm like, you know what? Let me buy a picture for everybody. Now that Nick's got four Wookiees with a life debt. I mean, we've got a whole gang. There's there's five of us now. No, six of us now six. between. Uh, and uh, so, you know what? Beer's on me. I'm going to get a couple, pit- a couple pitchers of Coors. Let's all just settle in and just... Take a deep breath. I'd like it to be noted that I wanted to go to TGI Fridays. You did. You wanted to go to TGI Fridays, and I don't know, maybe next time we'll go there. But in any event, I had one of those cards that you punch, and it's yeah. like I, I get a free pitcher well, of beer. Also, all of the other Wookies were for it. They so. were all in favor. The Wookies are great. Yeah. Wookies are up for a good time. Yeah. And so we go there, and uh, and then lo and behold, a couple of, couple of lads have probably had one too many uh, craft beers or whatever they're drinking, and they're fighting, and you being a magnanimous gentleman, step in and, and you know, and mediate the fight. And because they were in apparently a fight to the death. Yeah, it was a duel. I should I should clarify this. It wasn't a bar fight. It was a literal duel with blasters. Little, little did I know that if you, if you stop a duel, you've technically saved two lives. And it's another life debt. It's two life debts. And I, I'll just say this. Sprinkles, terrifying. Wait, is it Sprinkles or Sprinkles? Because I have been calling him Sprinkles. It's Sprank. That's why he always looks at you that way. It's Sprinkles. You know, hats off to him because he gives me that look. I know what you're talking about. He's never been mean about it, yeah. right? He doesn't want to correct me because- Looks w- like w- a nightmare. Wookie or they're, I going to put this, they're polite but temperamental. Mm. If, if you cross a line, they will rip your arms off. Yeah. But if you don't cross that line, they're basically Canadian. So uh, he's he's been absolutely delightful. I like Sprankles. I'm going to make a note of that Sprankles. And then Edward EJ. Yeah, yeah. Ed, Ed, Edward Jefferson. Edward Jefferson, w- which I thought maybe he was part human. Apparently, nope. It's uh, what do you call that? A false cognate or something? Like it's just completely random. That just happens to be a Wookiee name. Yeah, Edward Jefferson. Just- and so EJ and Sprankles joined the team. Who are now point, great friends. They're buddies. Yeah, now. It's that like, I am actually kind of proud of. Yeah, I'll I gotta, be honest. Yeah. But I live in a two-bedroom apartment, Heaton. Yeah. Oh, man. They didn't just leave when we left Kashyyyk. I told them. Like, when we were leaving, I was like, all right, guys, we're taking off. It was so nice. I love this whole life death thing. It was really cool for the couple days we were here. But I'm going to shuffle off the buffalo. We looked awesome when we went on Gabe and the Judge the following day. Because because we show up with an entourage. Like, you looked like a rock star. Like, and they just assumed. Uh, And then you're like, life debt. And then they all laughed. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> I, I knew. Like, and I was like, I, and I laughed because I was like, this is funny. Apparently, uh, this isn't the first time that something like this has happened. Really? Yeah. But it's rare. Yeah, yeah. It's definitely, well, it's like six in one trip is yeah. just uncanny. Yeah. I mean, like, it was, I mean, you're, you're falling into life debts left or right. But I figured, I really thought, this is what I thought was going to happen. Because mm. I'm, 
Again, I'm having a great time. These guys are fun to drink with. Uh, guys and gals, because there's Jubeca. They're they're fun to drink with. They're fun to hang out with. Um, and and like I'm, it's it, we got a built-in friendship group. Which you know, when we travel, it's kind of hard to make like a group of friends, right? So I'm having a blast. But I'm like, in the end of this, clearly they're all going to stay in Kashyyyk. And like, probably what's going to happen is it's a life debt. But also, we don't live on Kashyyyk, so you know, just while we're there, there in town is what I thought was going to happen, but apparently not. I have a two-bedroom apartment. I'll uh-huh. say again. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Yeah. <laughs> Look on your face. <laughs> and there, yeah. are, there are six. Six, six Wookie. Wookies. Yeah. And my wife. And your wife. And Megan. me. Yep. And they are, we're all living in Brooklyn right now. Uh-huh. In Brooklyn. Yep. Yep. You don't, it's not a lot of bang for your buck in you would, Brooklyn. You had to buy three bunk beds. Three and, bunk beds. Well, I mean, and thank God for them. IKEA. Yeah, and also like, like re- really, truly, thank God because a lot of IKEA's furniture is modular, and I like the the smallest Wookie that lives with you now is what seven feet. That's like the smallest. He technically he's like six eight. Yeah, that's Doctor Longara. Yeah, yeah. He Whereas Sprinkles is like a solid. Sprinkles eight, might be maybe nine, nine feet. feet tall. I mean, that guy. Yeah. Holy moly! And the thing is. I replaced every door in my apartment. Yeah, they keep already. banging through those. And it's just, I mean, it's a, it's Your mis- fridge is a nightmare. It smells terrible. You should like, really like, I because I come over when I can, right? And uh, you guys need a labeling system or something because you're- well, We had to get a chest freezer. Yeah, you need. Well, you really ought to get multiple fridges because yeah. it, like just keeping track of everybody's food in and of itself is already a thing. Yeah, and well, the thing too is like, you uh, now, I don't want to make this sound bad. But you tried to ditch the Wookiees multiple times. I mean, like, this was not... You tried to, like, you know, because you... we we It's your thing. So. And I would have gotten away with it, too. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. If only they weren't so fast. Yeah, they were... Well, because you... Nimble. You, you, you know, at the end, we're, we're, we're going to the spaceport, and you intentionally gave them the wrong spaceport, because you gave them... Uh, um, JF Baca, yeah, and we were actually going out of LaGuardia Baca, LaGuardia. <laughs> uh, and uh, but you and I was like, "Do you mean?" And you're like, "Yeah," and you gave me the super like, "Yeah, yeah JF that's Baca." What, that's what I'm about. And I was like, "Okay, great, yeah, we're gonna ten o'clock flight, guys," yeah. and uh, we go to LaGuardia Baca, and lo and behold, all the Wookies are already there. Well, I thought JF Baca was was smart because I thought they would go there because no one's right. gonna go to Newark, so I thought that yeah. it would just work, <laughs> you know, and they would maybe be fooled. And everybody was there. They were all there. They were all there. And like, not only were they there, they were, it could not have been less of a thing. Yeah. They could not have been less flapped yeah. from that having happened. And then we stopped at, uh, I don't know, Spaceport 32 Alpha or something. I can't remember where we were. Anyway, we stopped at some Spaceport to get beef jerky and stuff. And uh, you let them out and you were like, hey, anybody need a bathroom break? They all need to go to the bathroom. Um, interesting fact about Wookiees. Very large, not very large bladders. That's true. And and so they went behind the spaceport to find a bathroom. Uh-huh. Because they don't really- And then we took off. off. And I went as fast as yep. I could. Just hyperdrived. Yeah. And then they were just waiting in my apartment. They were already back at your apartment. It and- was great. Like, we come in and they're all- They'd already gotten an additional couch. So there's the one couch you've got facing the TV. And they stacked a second couch on top of that so that all six of them can sit on the couch at one time and watch TV. And we came in and like- one of them, uh, I don't remember which one it was. One of them looks over and like gives us a head nod. The other five don't even look. Yeah. They're just like, like just that was they're Tarful. really absorbed in Breaking Bad. But Tarful's the first one. You yeah. Know? So I do have kind of a soft spot for Tarful. Yeah. But here's the thing. Well, and I think, I'm going to be honest with you, I feel like Tarful might actually feel like he got kind of roped it. Like he didn't sign up to be with That's five true. other Wookiees, That's right? True. He just thought it was you and to a lesser extent me when yeah. I'm hanging out. Yeah. yeah. I mean, by the end, yeah, you kind of figured they. Knew what they were getting into, sort of. Yeah. Well, technically they have to, but also like, it's kind of like, if you agreed to take, this is a terrible analogy. One time when I, when I was first moving here to New York, I was moving into a new apartment Mm -hmm. and my roommates were like, we're going to get a cat, by the way. Mm -hmm. And I was like, all right, that's established. I'm not a cat person, but okay. And then they got two cats. I was like, well, I can't back out now. Right. Like that, like the emotional commitment's been made. But but it's more than I, it's more than I emotionally prepared myself for, which I think what Tarful's going through. Here's the thing. I just want to say this. If if you're listening, uh, I'm pretty sure that they took my neighbor's couch. 
Oh, really? There's I, there's a couch size hole in the wall. <laughs> oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. From that apartment to this apartment. So I think they just went over and took it. And uh, you you got to explain this sort of stuff because in, in Kashyyyk, they just kind of share stuff. It's just how that yeah. works. It's know? a very like laissez-faire. Exactly. Hit you back so, next week kind of. So anyway, we're going through some citizen tests lately and, and trying to get them kind of more associated. Because if I got to live with them, you know, it's just... Uh, we've been going to Costco a lot. Yeah. Man, the, the, a lot of changes. Can, can I, real quick, like, because I come over and it's I just have a blast. Yeah. I come we over know. and I'm like, this is great. Like, I bring over a six pack or usually a 12 pack. We're all hanging out and like back slapping. These guys are a hoot, right? But I get to leave. Like, how do you, what, what do you, you guys have one bathroom. What do you do? There's eight of you living in one apartment with one bathroom. Well, they all come to work with me as well. <laughs> so we got to wake up super early. Oh, that's right, because I got to protect you. So all yeah. of them can go to the bathroom before we can leave, before yeah. I can leave for work. Yeah. And so now I'm waking up at like 4 a.m. every day instead uh-huh. of 5. Yeah. Just so that I can get to work by 6. I'll be honest. The customers love You take love the them. subway or do you guys like, because yeah. between you, if you were to Uber, you could it wouldn't be that bad. I'm the only one with money here. Oh, no. Okay. None of them have brought anything with them. Okay. Yeah. Other than their bandoliers. Well, okay, yeah, cause, okay, that explains is it. It's illegal here, so they can't even wear them. Right. You no, know, this makes sense, because when I when I visited you at the coffee shop, yeah. I was like, so are you guys going to become mechanics? What are you going to do? And like they were like, we're going to assist Nick with whatever he's doing. And I was like, right, but they're not going to pay you guys anything extra. And they're like, it's not about the payment. It's about the life debt. And I was like, I get that. And it's awesome that there's six people, most of whom are more than we're seven trying. feet tall, we're working tr- here. But we don't, you don't need that many people. We're trying to see if they can possibly get some sort of job that I can, they can do while I'm home. Chube- I, I've been talking to Chewbacca, and she's going to hop on Fiverr. Well, that's because she's very talented. She is I'll very talented. She, no, she's, she's she, the I most, think she could be an artist. She's the most strong-willed, I think, to do yeah. her own stuff. Yeah. And I think she kind of resents this whole thing as well. Well, and like I got to say, like... It's probably not easy being uh, the only woman. I guess your wife, uh, but like you know, like being being in a, a two bedroom apartment in New York with one guy and six Wookies or five other Wookies. Like you know, like that's probably tough on her. Like yeah. I, I would imagine she probably wants a little bit more personal space and like we all do. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Yeah. 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 Everybody wants more personal space. Here. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Everybody. Yeah. So, we're looking for a new place as we speak. Yeah, that makes sense. But we're going to have to figure out some income, some means, because uh, uh, we can barely afford my apartment as it is, much less the three-bedroom or four-bedroom. Right. You uh, might have to move to the suburbs. Oh, God. Yeah. Uh, well, in any event, man, uh, I mean, I, I would gladly take them, but they won't come. So, you know, I'll just- Keep swinging by and uh, they over love to- you. Oh no, because you know what? And they are so f- like I don't think people realize how funny Wookies are at Quiplash. No, yeah. they are very good at Quiplash. Um, Cards have- Against Humanity, man. Well, it's hard because the translation. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But Quiplash are pretty good. Great. Well, let's go ahead and wrap up today. We'll do the ranking of Kashyyyk. How we how we like so this we're is get- what we're going to start doing, right? We're going to start. We're going to start about- doing this. Yeah, we're going to start. Um, we were doing me hitting up Tinder, which I'll still talk about periodically, and I still do check out Tinder every planet I go to. <laughs> it's just that I felt like enough Wookie related hijinks happened on this trip that I didn't need to talk about the date I went on. Uh, so we'll, and I still usually Yelp review, but for our purposes, yeah. Nick and I will now say our favorite thing about a planet, our least favorite thing about the planet, and like on a scale of one to ten, how how likely we are to go back. So uh, my favorite thing about Kashyyyk, uh, love the trees. I just, it is, I love forests and I thought Kashyyyk was just beautiful and just the air is so fresh. That was my favorite thing. What was your favorite thing about Kashyyyk? My favorite thing, uh, I really, I, I genuinely liked uh, the empanadas. They were good. Agreed. That was it. Yeah. Okay. Well, both great things. My least favorite thing. I hate to be a stickler about this. The sales tax, thirteen percent, really? Yeah, it's like that's Chicago sales. Yeah, tax. Yeah, yeah, that's that like, like and it make. I, I mean, they don't. I don't think they pay income tax, but mm-hmm. I don't live there, so it doesn't make a difference to me. So that mm-hmm. was kind of a high, high thing. So that was my least favorite thing. Was a thirteen percent sales tax. How about you? Life debts. Oh right, yeah, that makes sense because the, the six life debts because <laughs> of the six Wookies living in your New York apartment now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, and a scale of one to ten, I would put it at like a nine for me. I mean, you know what? I'm going to say eight because I really did enjoy the Fembot Planet. I mean, that's currently the nine. I'm going to give it an eight point five of me going back. I'd say Fembot Planet and Kashyyyk are my two favorite places we've been to so far. 
Uh, this is hard for me because if I go back, I'm hoping to drop off some Wookiees. Mm. So I guess six. So maybe. Okay. All right. So six. Eight, eight point Vulcan's, six. Vulcan's like up there for me. It's probably like yeah. an 8.9, I'd say. Okay. So this is probably mid middle of the pack. So maybe 5.9, six. Okay. All right. Excellent. All right, Nick, I'll, uh, I'll swing by later this week to hang out with you and the lads. Uh. That's the show. We survived a dark but fun journey into Imperial Apologism. Good job, you guys. Thanks, Jonathan Last, for coming on to blow my mind and make me think a little bit harder about voting Rebel. Thanks, Taylor Stanridge, for cleaning up the audio. And thanks, Nick Spruduti, for a fun trip to 